the farm bill to a lot of us might seem not very relevant. It's just relevant to farmers. But the truth is, it is literally a, a program that impacts more Americans than any other government program. And it's not just about farmers and ranchers. It's about our food, our water, the air we breathe. It's about the wildlife. It's it's really about also the future of the planet. And so this is an enormous opportunity for us, and we don't want to miss it. Welcome to Season 3 of Towards a Kinder Public, a podcast dedicated to designing kinder public space that better meets our interconnected needs. I'm Kevin Castle, and along with Annie Chen, we are Kinder Public. This is the first episode of a special two-part Civic How-To conversation with climate activist Pamela Tate. We've broken the conversation into two parts on the podcast, but you can find the full presentation as a video on our new YouTube channel, where we are at Kinder Public, or find it linked from our website, kinderpublic.com. In the video presentation, you will find vibrant visuals of the methods and policies we discuss. If you are listening via the podcast, we are so glad you are here, and we'll describe the information so that you can follow along. We are really fortunate to have Pamela here to walk us through the regenerative agriculture and agroforestry recommendations for one of the most important pieces of legislation on climate for the foreseeable future, which is the 2023 Farm Bill. Pamela is the chair of campaigns for the Chicago Metro chapter of the Climate Reality Project and a member of the Board of Directors of American Forests where she serves as the chair of the External Affairs Committee, as well as many other leadership roles in organizations serving climate, education, and disability missions. Over the past few episodes of Towards a Kinder Public, we have talked about organic and regenerative agriculture, such as our conversation with Don Viaselli, a climate activist, in numerous leadership roles, and the incredible organizer who works with Pamela, to develop the policy paper and civic information we are reviewing today, as well as Elizabeth Henderson, a trailblazing New York organic farmer and leader in community-conscious agricultural systems. Today, we build on that information by reviewing the specific recommendations we can share with our congressperson to make meaningful improvements to our access to nutritious food and to our climate resilience as well as better support our farmers who are employing conservation and climate smart methods. This review is detailed to help us all feel confident to advocate for regenerative agriculture and agroforestry methods. Next week, in part two, Pamela will take us step by step through the method that she uses to reach out to her congressperson and request a meeting to share information. It's really an informative and encouraging talk, especially if you are just beginning to get more involved in this type of advocacy work. Please listen to these episodes and help us by reaching out to your elected representatives. The time to update our agricultural and food system legislation is now. So I hope you join us again next week for the step-by-step -step civic how-to, but if you're ready to get to work, you can find the entire presentation on YouTube right now. As always, thank you for listening. We appreciate you so much. I hope you enjoy this conversation. Pamela Tate, thank you so much for joining me this morning. I really appreciate your time, and I'm looking forward to discussing the civic how-to information with you. It's great to be here, and uh, I appreciate the invitation because we really want to get people working on advocating for the farm bill. Um, so I'll just begin by, um, I will go over a few of the pieces of information about uh, regenerative agriculture and agroforestry, just so that 
we're all on the same page. But I think the thing that I want to emphasize the most is that the farm bill to a lot of us might seem not very relevant. It's just relevant to farmers. But the truth is, it is literally a, a program that impacts more Americans than any other government program. And it's not just about farmers and ranchers. It's about our food, our water, the air we breathe. It's about the wildlife. It's it's really about also the future of the planet. And so this is an enormous opportunity for us, and we don't want to miss it. Then, just briefly, I'm going to cover the soil depletion and its relationship to climate change very quickly, how these practices that we're talking about can help. Um, what they actually are, uh, and then what can we change using the Farm Bill? And, and how do we advocate uh, conservation in the Farm Bill? What are, what are the ways that we go about that? Mm -hmm. Now, I just want you to see this picture because I don't know about you, but this is very disturbing to me mm -hmm. because the dark blue areas and, and the really cobalt blue areas are the areas worst affected by soil erosion. And that's what we need to know going in, is that global soil health is definitely in decline. Degradation of farmland soil, it, it causes uh, crops to be less productive. Um, and because there's more global warming and more carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, that that's may even makes crops more unproductive. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it the the thing that we've got to do is reverse these uh, practices that are degrading our soils. And one thing I wanted to mention, you may or may not know, is that about 3.2 billion people across the planet are suffering from degraded soils. That is almost half of the world's population. Mm. So everybody knows it, but we're not necessarily taking steps fast enough to do something about it. Well, this is interesting. Could I actually ask a question about that point? I think it's still a very common misconception that changing our agricultural systems will cause less nutrition rather than better and improved access to nutrition, because there's an impression that industrial farming actually increases the access to healthy food. Is that true? Uh, no. Um, that is a misconception. The conventional agricultural methods produce more food, but the food that they produce is less nutritious. Mm -hmm. And every time you add chemical fertilizers or uh, any other chemical inputs, including pesticides, in the soil, you kill a lot of the natural microorganisms that are in the soil. Uh, and you end up having uh, nutritional um, problems with, with what you're growing. Mm -hmm. And uh, one example that I read in a research, I've read many research reports, but one of them <laughs> was um, what said that we would have to eat eight oranges today to get the same nutritional value as our grandparents did eating one ah, mm -hmm. um, because of how they're grown. So it's like there's more of them, but, but we're still not getting what we need. Mm -hmm. So I think that's the that that misconception is a, is a huge problem. Thank you. I just wanted to mention the International uh, Governmental Committee on Policy Change. You know, they they are pointing out that on the climate side, not we were on nutrition, but on the climate side of the house, agriculture and the food system are key to global climate change. How we do agriculture could make an enormous difference in what we are able to pull down out of the atmosphere in the way of CO2. So I I just want to briefly review with you the, um, the, the principles of regenerative agriculture. And these are the ones that I think you've covered before, so I won't do as much in detail on them. But a really important one that was new to me is make sure that you have the least disturbance of the soil that you can. And, and remember, there's a big difference between soil and, soil and dirt, because once all the nutrients are out of the soil, they just become dry dirt. And, and that's why you have dust storms and we had the dust bowl in the 30s, because there wasn't anything left in the soil to 
hold it together. Um, so the the thing that's exciting, I think, is that you you don't disturb the soil, you don't till the land and expose the soil. You just drop seeds in the ground and you don't use chemical fertilizers and pesticides. Um, you also uh, don't let the, the fields be barren in the winter. You use little cover crops that will cover the ground all winter long. Um, so, because then you're, you're, you're protecting the soil by doing that. In other words, keep it in the ground and cover it up. <laughs> it's pretty clear. <laughs> um, and then you also should, of course, do composting and, and make sure that the organic matter that you're, that you're composting with goes back to enrich the soil. Then, you know, we, we really believe strongly that if you're going to produce animals, and there's a lot of uh, controversy about mm-hmm. animals, um, but if you're going to grow and breed animals, then you've got to stop putting them in these controlled animal feeding operations and put them into uh, grazing areas and forested areas. Because if they if their waste is in that kind of an area, it just enriches the soil. Whereas when it's in a dry feedlot with nowhere to go, it just ends up causing methane emissions. Mm-hmm. It's a pollutant. Yeah, it's it's a huge pollutant, but it doesn't have to be if it's done uh, as a part of a regenerative integrated farm. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, I just would say building biodiversity in generally is really good for the soil, meaning in maybe incorporate uh, perennials, um, perennial grasses, uh, mm-hmm. trees, shrubs. What they do is keep the roots in the ground. And that's where you want them. Because the more roots you have in the ground, the more water control you have, and the less prone the farm is to flooding. And just keep in mind the way that these crops vary based on where you live. Like you wouldn't plant the same uh, row crops or the same kind of trees if you're in Arizona versus if you're in the state of Illinois. But there are people that can help you with that. So those are the things that I think will make a real difference. And this is just a picture of each of them. That's what a um, no-tilling looks like on the left. See all that all that grass and, and stuff in the middle? Mm-hmm. Cover crop. And whereas in the winter to the right, that's what things look like. So just to describe this for people who may not have access to the visuals at this moment, on the uh, left side of the screen, we're looking at a picture where we have brown, dry looking grass strips uh, interspersed with green, vibrant looking crop strips where the brown uh, cover crop, which is uh, finished its life cycle, is now protecting and covering the soil. And on the right side, we have a picture of a till agricultural setup where the entire soil surface is completely exposed to the sun, deeply grooved and available to be blown away by the wind. Right. This is just no need to probably explain this one. I've already talked about the biological and crop diversity part, but I just thought that was a great picture of a bee on a flower. What you want to do is you want to Mm -hmm. promote pollinators. And by doing diverse plantings, you do. You you increase your your, um, biological and crop diversity. Um, Now, there's another picture here. You could explain that if you'd like, but it's it's what a cover crop looks like um, in the off season. In other words, when it's when we're not in the growing season. And on the left, you you've got this very brown, bare soil, uh, and it's easily blown away. We we lose tons of topsoil per acre every year. Mm-hmm. On the right, I don't know what it is. I don't know what that crop is, but it's it's the same kind of land, but it's covered. Mm-hmm. like this all winter. And like you mentioned, there are different, there are people that can help you determine what the appropriate cover crop is too, and for what you're trying to achieve and what's available where you live. Exactly. What's native. Mm-hmm. This might be one of the last two comparisons. If you um, cause your animals to, to graze or be in a very confined area, you will see land barren like this. 
If, on the other hand, you do planned grazing, where you literally move them from paddock to paddock uh, over the growing season, and they are grazing in different areas, you allow time for the for the soil to regenerate and for it to use their waste in an effective way. So it's very important to graze one section at a time, one one part of the pasture at a time, and then let the remainder of the pasture rest. That's I remember hearing one farmer say that to me. I just let it rest, <laughs> and which is a nice concept, you know. We all need rest, right? That's right. So then. This is really important. On the left side, you see a plane dropping uh, huge amounts of pesticides. Um, And on the right, you see no chemicals, a greener um, area that has lots of grass and lots of trees and woods behind. It's just a whole lot more uh, healthy for not only the animals, but us. You know, Mm -hmm. we don't want the pesticides in our food, you know, and many of them do end up in our food. So that would be another thing. And that's one of the reasons that farmers are more profitable when they use regenerative approaches. It's because they're not paying for all the fertilizers and the pesticides. So they may produce fewer crops because they're diversifying them but they're more profitable. That's often another misconception that regenerative farming doesn't make money. It actually does. Mm -hmm. And and a lot of farmers will will tell us that. And then just briefly here, we also wrote a a paper. And when we were talking to congressmen, we discussed with them the practices of agroforestry. And that's not talked about as much. For some reason, I, and I really don't know why it hasn't gotten the attention that farming itself has gotten. And w- because what you can do if you plant uh, trees in various ways, uh, which I'll, I'll just mention briefly, if you do that, you can stabilize your soil and you can pull down more carbon. So you can also increase nutritional value in the food. Um Tree roots uh, are wonderful stabilizers and uh, kind of safeguards against flooding and drought. Um, So the the picture here is that we're seeing is animals grazing under trees. So the, the idea is to farm with trees, not to cut the trees down so that you can farm. This is actually the more original farming system for this continent. And it's been, like you said, it's been removed from our awareness. David Gisson, in his recent book, The Architecture of Disability, discusses how the representation and imagery around agriculture has favored the European method of clearing the land, whereas we see in in some naturalist paintings and documentation that early on agroforestry was absolutely the way that indigenous people maximized the amount of food that they were getting out of the land, but in a healthy, respectful way. Yeah, that's absolutely right. I mean, you know, I guess I, I, I wasn't as aware of the benefits of agroforestry until we started doing this research, but now I really see how the tree root systems improve the aggregation of the soil and organic matter. They they have a way of pulling it in and retaining it. Um, and when we've seen pictures of farmlands, one next to the other, where one is totally flooded and the other isn't, it's always when the one that's in good shape is always one with diversified crops and trees. Uh, so, you know, we, we've got a lot of proof that this works. We just need to get the word out. <laughs> I'm showing some pictures that people may or may not be able to see just of what we mean when we say agroforestry. We might mean something like this, alley cropping. That is uh, where you plant a single or multiple rows of trees in parallel to the, to the crops. You break up every so often, you put in a row of trees. Um, then there's wind breaks. Um, this is where the trees are, are, I have big fields on the screen and then the trees are in a row and they, they are called um, alto shelter belts. Mm, they're the planting of trees as barriers to protect a specific area downwind. And they help reduce wind erosion. 
Um, so those are those are also really important. And then there's um, the third kind of is is these riparian buffers, and what they are is you plant those at the edge of bodies of water, and what that does is it it buffers the water bodies from potential negative impacts of cropland or, or pasture because it reduces soil erosion by having them at the edge instead of having them just wash into the rivers and, and end up in dead zones in the ocean. Um, so th those are th that is another method that, that can be that can be followed based on where you live. And then we've already looked at this, this what's called silvo pasture, which is grazing your animals in the forest. You know, um, that's a much more attractive picture than a controlled animal feeding operation. <laughs> Do we just see a bunch? <laughs> of, we see a bunch of cattle just grazing in the middle of a bunch of trees, right? Yeah, those must be healthier, happier animals too. They are. They are. And then the last one, just quick, is forest farming, and that's where you can cultivate uh, shade tolerant specialty crops. That means, like, uh, let's see, like medicinal herbs like mushrooms, things like that. Um, it can help protect forests and keep from causing uh, flooding and helps with uh, drought as well. So um, these are all ways to add more value to your land, but also help the climate. Because the more of these things you have, the more uh, CO2 is going to be sequestered. Okay, so now that we've just done our little, you know, kind of, 101 on <laughs> regenerative agriculture and agroforestry. Um, I want to focus on the farm bill itself because, it, as I said before, it's the most important bill in, in that it affects every person in the country. Uh, and it's coming up this year. Every, every five or six years, it comes up for reauthorization. And one of the reasons that it is so, so critical is that it has a, a conservation title in it. There are eight titles. And the conservation title is absolutely central to moving to regenerative practices. And that's what got me interested in it, in, in fact, a couple of years back. Um, so I want to share with you in a moment the policy recommendations that we have made for regenerative agriculture and agroforestry. Then we'll do a, a little bit of information and resources at the end. But look at the size of it. The U.S. Farm Bill is a $1.3 trillion. Wow. I mean, it's huge. One of the titles goes for nutrition, what used to be called food stamps, mm -hmm. but is now called the Supplemental Nutritional Assistance Program, mm -hmm. uh, SNAP. But after you take that out, that 84% out, then what you have left is uh, $79.7 .7 billion in the crop insurance title. We're going to look at that quickly. You've got $59.2 in this all-important title, conservation. And you've got $56.1 in commodity subsidies. Um, so, you know, those those are the three that we, have, we focused on. And I also want everybody to remember when they talk to their legislator that this year, this is unusual, but this year, the Inflation Reduction Act that was passed a year ago, it provides an additional $10 billion for climate smart agricultural practices. Now, it isn't in the farm bill, but it's almost like an add-on to the farm bill. We want to make sure that Congress does not take away that $10 billion and put it into something else. We want to make sure we save that $10 billion for climate smart practices, because those are exactly the practices we've been talking about. So I'm just going to review for you the recommendations that we we zeroed in on. Now there could be there are more, there are many more that would improve it, but I just felt that it was important for us to drill down to the big six that we thought could make the most difference. And the first one is to upgrade and enhance programs, incentives, and funding that will help scale up RA practices, regenerative ag practices. And, and further, that would make reducing greenhouse gas emissions a priority for the spending. Because right now it's not, a, it's not listed as a, a priority in the spending. To me, that is really critical. 
Right. And there are there are lots of specifics under that that I could talk to you about. Right now, though, for example, between 39 and 69 percent of the applications for moving to a conservation approach are denied due to lack of funding. Wow. So even though all these farmers want to do this, many, many want to do this, it's just not it's just not easy to get anything approved. There's just not enough money there. So we could really use that additional $10 billion from the IRA. The other thing is that often the conservation title passes as part of the law, but then it's subject to the annual appropriations process. Mm -hmm. So it's an easy area to cut. It has in the past. So we are trying to make sure that it becomes a mandatory program that is not subject to annual appropriations reductions. To me, that's a a critical one. Yes. Then we, we have one recommendation related to the crop insurance title. And why are we focused on crop insurance, you might wonder. <laughs> but what I want to share with you, which I was surprised to learn, is that if you decide as a conservation-minded person that you want to transition your farm to the approaches I'm talking about, it will take two to three years to make that transition. Uh, and with trees, it might will take a few more because they have to grow. Well, if you go that way, then you lose your crop insurance discount because the crop insurance premium discounts are geared to large commodity crops, conventional agriculture. It's all all related to what the yield is per acre rather than what the soil is doing. And so essentially you have to, you kind of have to choose between conservation and insurance. I mean, that's what it feels like to me. And that's a huge disincentive for farmers. You know, what they need is the opposite. They need an incentive to move into conservation. So just to be clear, the conservation title, if you go into that part and you want to get funded from one of the many programs there, you have to diversify your crops. You have to include a non-commodity cover crop or, you know, you would lose your support through the conservation title program. So this is a serious problem, and I don't think it's talked about enough. You could, for example, you could reward farmers who use good soil health with a higher premium subsidy, a higher subsidy amount, uh, or an adjusted insurance premium rate. There are a number of ways that legislators could make this change, and we do recommend some of them in our document. So the third thing that we are talking about with every congressman's staff that we can reach is we've got to do something about the resources that are given to the Natural Resources Conservation Service. I talked with several of them myself with agents that because I didn't I don't own a farm, I don't know about this. So I tried to get to know them and to to a person they said we don't have the staff or the technical expertise to help farmers implement regenerative practices. We know about them, but unless a farmer comes to us and specifically says that they need this help, we we don't really go out there because we don't have the manpower to do it. And they they told us that they thought that they needed training. Uh, They needed, you know, new curriculum. And so in our in our policies, we have suggested things like a certification curriculum for all technical service providers in the in the NRCS. This could be done, I think, without a huge amount of expense. I mean, it would be it would cost, but it's doable. And then we suggest ways for farmers themselves to go through soil health education and training. Um, and that, that would that would raise awareness and get this to happen more quickly. So we've got just three others. We noticed that 2%, less than 2% of public funds are going to support research in this area. It seems so strange to me because the the practices have been proven to be more profitable and better for nutrition and for animals and for pollinators and for carbon sequestration. And yet 2%, less than 2% of the money for research goes into regenerative ag. 
And all the research that is funded is for promotion of inputs like chemicals into farming. A lot of the research at universities is funded by the agrochemical industry. And so, of course, they have an interest in these areas and they have the money. So we need our public dollars to be going into research in the conservation area. And then this one, this one is this fifth recommendation is a little less obvious. So I'm going to spend just a bit of time on it. We're suggesting that the farm bill incentivize the investment in infrastructure that would support a diverse food system. And to give you an idea of why this is needed, uh, farmers told us they need regional services, the kind of subsidies that are currently only going to the largest industrial farms. Um, For example, seed cleaning facilities, storage for crops, places to have crops inspected, all of the USDA programs for looking at what farmers are producing. Right now, they they are down to, I think, let me see if I have the number. Yeah, it, to, there's only 850 of them now across the whole country. Whereas in the late 60s, there were 10,000 of them. So it makes it really difficult for a small or regional farmer to even get an appointment, uh, to even get to them. Uh, So this really puts them at a disadvantage. So what we're trying to do is to say, let's use some of the dollars, maybe from the IRA, to um, introduce some mobile units, some regional services, and the kinds of subsidies that currently are going to only the largest conventional farming facilities. And let's, let's incentivize doing it the way we're suggesting, and maybe even remove some of the subsidies from controlled animal feeding operations. Um, because, because I read this this amount, and at first I thought it couldn't be true, but it is. If you subsidize a controlled animal feeding operation, and then you you have to, of course, then add a digester to digest the methane, and those digesters are $4 million each. Wow. And so why is the government purchasing methane digesters, which we wouldn't need if we weren't farming that way? <laughs> mm-hmm. I don't know about you, but that really... Yes, no, that actually was a, a big topic in uh, one of our recent podcast episodes with a New York organic farmer who was talking about the unreliability of that system, the environmental damage. Um, the loss of the natural fertilizer for yeah. pasture. <laughs> right. And then the, the use of the methane product to feed into natural gas right. pipelines. Right. I, thank you for saying that because I was going to mention that at the end. Yes, it, it, it's just used to produce more fossil fuel energy. Yeah. So I just don't understand why we would need to subsidize these controlled animal feeding operations and then subsidize the purchase of methane digesters. If you just think if you if you took that four million dollars for each one of them and you instead uh, put it into regional and local and mobile services, what a difference it could make. So the last one is on our agroforestry topic that I brought up earlier. We've come to believe from all the research that we need to do the same thing here. We need to expand the incentives and the funding to implement these practices. We've got to help farmers understand that. You don't cut down trees to do farming. You farm with your trees and you manage them and they will help your soil. We're losing 5.4 tons of topsoil per acre per year right now. That's a lot. That's a lot of topsoil. And we don't want another dust bowl and that's where we're headed. So we need to stop that from happening. Um, I'm not going to go through the Um, agroforestry policy requests in any detail because you've already gone through what the agroforestry practices are. But remember that right now there's very few incentives and there's very little funding. So obviously those things need to be changed. And then we need to do the same thing here that we are, what we were arguing for in the regenerative agriculture area. We need to fund education, information dissemination, research. We need to fund the technical assistance providers. We put in in our little slide here, 
the titles we're talking about, Title V, Title XI. Title XI is crop insurance title. So this has the same issue as regenerative agriculture in general. We, you know, it isn't getting, it isn't allowing farmers to make good choices. Um, so that that is that is the second one, and then we also go really in depth about number three, which is um, to really expand protections for existing natural forests, and not just on public land, but on private land as well. Um, hoping that we can get some incentives to build public-private partnerships uh, or get private landowners to conserve these forests because we need them um, for for sequestration of carbon, but also for wildlife protection of habitat. So we, we're hoping that we could the farm bill could expand these protections and in doing so in, increase the health of the soil. So the research research in every single area is just needed right now, uh, and training and, and technical assistance. I know that's always the solution talked about, but the truth is, it's the best one. You know, everybody needs it. So last, we looked at the forestry title, Title VIII, and I thought that this was really an important statistic to share with you, that the, the U.S. National Greenhouse Gas Inventory, which was issued by the EPA in April of last year, it states that U.S. forests sequestered an offset of approximately 13% of the gross greenhouse gas emissions from the U.S. And if we planted many additional trees and forests, uh, we could make a huge difference in pulling down more carbon from the atmosphere. And, and we're talking about um, including money for native plant surveys, native seed banks, native plant nurseries, um, everything that will build the supply chain for trees. Seed banks, we're short of seeds right now and nurseries are trying to, to get uh, get more of them. Um, I am on the board of directors of American Forests. So I know quite a bit about the seed bank issue. And if there were more federal funding to support this, it would make a huge difference to people um, in terms of how likely they'd be to make the change. Um, so uh, we, having seen all this, said to ourselves, well, the big agricultural and chemical interests are lobbying, so we better we better do the same thing, <laughs> you know? Right. Be sure to check out our website for links and resources from Pamela for this episode the talking points that Pamela mentioned in our conversation, and some graphics that explain the way the Farm Bill is organized. As always, a full transcript of the conversation is available on the podcast section of our website, kinderpublic.com, as well as a captioned video version on YouTube. If you have enjoyed an episode of Towards a Kinder Public, we would love your help in sharing the episode with others. And please leave us a rating and a review. It helps us make our topics more visible, and we really appreciate your support. You can find us on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube. We love to hear from you. We are at Kinder Public. I'm Kevin Castle. My guest has been Pamela Tate, Chair of Campaigns of the Climate Reality Project, Chicago Metro Chapter. Have a very good week. <laughs>